Hello, this is Peter Bell, and I'm here with Dr. Alan Carter from Cabral Gold. Hello, Alan. Good morning, Peter. Wonderful to be talking to you. Um, it's August 29th now, I believe, and you had some news recently on the 27th. Yeah, we think it's very significant news, Peter. I mean, as you're aware, we've been putting out a, a fairly constant stream of news throughout the summer and prior to that on our exploration program at, uh, at the Kuyu Kuyu project in Brazil, where we already have a million ounces of um, indicated and inferred um, resource. Um, and um, the uh, the press release that we put out on, on the 27th of August um, earlier this week um, we think is um, some of the more significant news that we've um, we've put out in recent months. Uh, basically, um, the QUQ project has four deposits so far drilled off uh, on the project. Uh, two of them uh, are larger, the largest one being a deposit called Central. Um, and um, and this, um, We've always been looking for the, um, the both the southern and the northern extensions to the central deposit. We're optimistic and we've got a whole bunch of um, lines of evidence that suggest that deposit could, could continue to the, to the north. To the south, it's always been a bit enigmatic. Um, we did a little bit of drilling uh, to the south of what we know to be the limits of the deposit. And, and um, the best drill hole that we got from about four or five holes that were drilled to the south immediately to the south, I'm only talking a few hundred meters, was 27 meters at 6.9 grams a ton, um, which is a very good intercept, and that's outside the resource. Now, uh, until recently, really until this year, we haven't had a chance to follow up on that drill result. And whilst we haven't done any drilling or started any drilling yet uh, as follow-up work, what we have been doing, Peter, is some auger drilling. And so these are motorized augers, which will, where we drill down about 25 meters through the uh, soil cover and through a newly recognized uh, sequence of uh, unconsolidated clays and sands which are really masking the underlying bedrock and so we've had the opportunity now to do that on the south end of the central deposit and we've got a booming auger anomaly um, <laughs> it, uh, which has you know um, gold values consistently in five or six different auger holes um, you know, about 500 meters south of, or, or really southeast of the of the central deposit. So, and this is an area where traditionally we've been using soil sampling, and soil sampling has been great at finding the existing deposits. But we have recognised, as I just mentioned, that um, a large part, probably up to 70 percent of the area, is covered by these unconsolidated sands and muds, um, which are masking the underlying bed bedrock response. So. Um, that recognition has been very significant for us because what it means is that soil sampling in those areas would be un un ineffective. And so the central southeast area to have drilled through those sediments and to have got booming uh, gold in soil, uh, sorry, gold in um, saprolite anomalies, which is the top of the bedrock, um, is very, very important. And, and that auger line is actually open to the north and south as well as to the east. So, so we're really excited. I mean, it, it could potentially represent the extension to the to the central deposit which right now has just under 500,000 ounces in terms of if you sum up the indicated and, and inferred categories but but we think it's going to get quite a lot larger so it, it's exciting yeah so much to talk about there um, I think a lot of people aren't maybe familiar with the auger drilling but I have been very keen on it since I first heard about it from you and I didn't realize it was up to 25 meters of cover that you'd be going through to get into the saprolite there. Well, no, I mean, we didn't, we didn't realize that either. In fact, uh, up until about <laughs> uh, January, February of this year, we had no idea that the, there was, there was any cover here at all. You know, the, the traditionally what we've done and what we, what had been done historically on this project is, is a, a, a soil sampling grid. And, um, and you know historically there's 12,000 soil samples been collected on the property and that's been very effective at, at finding the existing deposits there um, but those deposits are really uh, islands that were sticking out of a lake um, and didn't happen to be covered by these sediments the, the, the rest of the area the majority of the project area seems to have been covered by these sediments which is effectively masking the underlying bedrock and, and we're now starting to see and recognize um, 
the fact that there is mineralization, uh, and it looks like there's quite a lot of mineralization, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> which is sitting underneath these um, these quite recent clays and clays and sandstone. So it's a it's a very significant development, um, and it's something that's given us enormous new insight into the potential scale of this project. Yeah, and that analogy you just referred to about the island sticking up out of the lake. Um, you know, central resource area there. Is that an area that you'd describe as being one of those islands that was kind of sticking up um, and having, I don't believe there was any saprolite exposed at surface, but there was, you know, at least the soil response at, in that area. Yeah, yeah, we had a, a really cracking uh, golden soil anomaly at, at Central, and we've got one or two others that are good. But, uh, but those the, the, those areas are not covered by these sediments. And so, yeah. Yeah, and but Central areas, Southeast, just just nearby, a kilometer away, that is covered. Yeah, I mean it's as close as a, 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 in some cases less than a hundred meters. You can go from wow. a, a soil profile where you get through the soil and you're straight into the weathered bedrock or saprolite. And you can move 50 to 100 meters away and you can have a sequence of 10, 15, 20 meters of unconsolidated sands and muds, which was clearly related to some sort of lake uh, system, which is very close to it. So, so it's really important and, and, and it's exciting. And, and, and as I said, we're now starting to find things that are underneath this, um, this very, um, not, not really very thick, but uh, sequence of muds and sands and, and the, a release that we put out on uh, Via Rica, I think it was back in July. Um, no, sorry, it was early August. It was earlier this month. Yep. Uh, it's one of those um, relatively new, it's a new occurrence, which um, which is sitting under these um, unconsolidated sediments. So it's, like I said, it has given us enormous new insight into the project. And the picture that's gradually emerging, uh, Peter, from this is that Kuyu Kuyu is truly a district scale project. Um, we already knew that it had produced an awful lot of placer gold more than any other area uh, in, in the whole region. And the Tapajos region, as you're well aware, is the world's third largest placer gold belt. It's very large. It produced 20 to 30 million ounces. Kuyu Kuyu produced getting on for 10% of that amount and was the largest of the historic Garimpos in the area. So, so um, we think there's an awful lot more gold there. Clearly, there is on surface, and so uh, we we now at uh, some point soon have to move the drills on and um, and sort of test some of these areas. Yeah, well, and you are the team um, with you know the presence in the field to be able to do that work in a expeditious way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we I think we've got. Uh, at an exploration team in Brazil locally that is second to none. Uh, Rory McKnight, who's our uh, uh, manager there, is a guy who's lived in Brazil for about 20 years. And uh, Rory was uh, one of the key guys who was instrumental in, in putting the uh, first gold mine into production in this region. So he's a very experienced guy and, uh, and he's very well connected at the local level. And then we have a, um, a VPX um, who's... Um, working on a consultant basis for us called Adrian MacArthur. And Adrian is also Australian and, and has really, really transformed our understanding of the, uh, of the geology of this project. We are really, really starting to get to dial in on the vectors to, to mineralization. Uh, and uh, that, that sharpening of focus is really starting to pay dividends. And I think you can see that from the news that we've put out for the last two or three months. And, and regarding that technical breakthrough um, in your geological understanding here, is that, is that somewhat uh, unprecedented, really, in terms of Brazilian gold exploration? Um, well, I, I think it certainly is in the Tapajos. So I haven't heard uh, um, any, anybody else who's worked in, in this part of the world talking about uh, the presence of this... Uh, this, these cover sequences that may be masking uh, um, potential mineralization. So yeah. I can't speak for the rest of Brazil, but um, but I do think it's important. And I mean, the other advances we're really making is um, in our understanding of the geophysical signatures of the, of the deposits in, in our area. Um, we've always known that there is a, uh, a, 
a very pronounced magnetic signature, but we've been re reprocessing the magnetic data in particular and some uh, ground IP data, and it's given us tremendous insight into the potential signatures on these things. So as I said, um, mm. uh, you know, it's all about having a, a whole series of tools in the toolbox as you try and uh, narrow down um, uh, your, uh, your exploration uh, targeting rationale. And as I said, uh, I think we're really starting to dial things in. Well, and, and it may be risky and reckless to go off and send a drill into some target area on the property that hasn't had as much kind of ground truthing as uh, the areas around the known resources here. But with that 18 kilometers uh, golden soils anomaly, I and and your new understanding of the, the soil cover, everything coming together, I, I I just hold. I wonder what would happen if you if you sent out a crew into some part of the property, you know, that you hadn't done a lot of work in, and you were able to plug a hole that <laughs> ended up coming up with some crazy gold numbers that, you know, it's th that that could really surprise a lot of people and and show, you know, the the. The benefits of the technical understanding here, <laughs> putting well, together. Yeah, we're certainly already do, al already uh, doing that. I mean, it, it was already a very large golden soil anomaly, but but obviously that doesn't take into any account the the fact that a large portion of the property is mass. So uh, the, the the gold signature here is actually larger than what we thought, and yeah. so we are sending out our geos into areas where we've previously done no drilling or previously done very little work. And they are starting to come back with all sorts of interesting, um, interesting results. So, I, you know, I'm looking forward to a very interesting fall. Well, this constant stream of results from us will continue. Uh, well, and, you know, it's unfortunate that the market is still uh, depressed, um, but we are going to keep doing what we're doing because um, we are, you know, 100% believe that the Kuyu Kuyu will ultimately. Uh, Proved to be one of the largest gold deposits in Brazil, and we won't stop till we prove that up. <laughs> Wonderful! That's well. That takes that kind of uh, a madman's determination, on, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know about the madman, but I we certainly are <laughs> people. And and you know, look, look, I am speaking from some experience in the fact that we have been involved directly in five gold discoveries in Brazil, of which this is one. And uh, we were directly involved in Tocantinsinho. Cajuero, uh, Karinga, and and the Polito, uh, and Rory was directly involved in the in the Polito mine and getting that one into production. So, so you know, I firmly believe, Peter, that that um, when you identify an area which really does have world class potential, and and there could be an enormous gold deposit there, you need to be tenacious and you need to persevere. It's very easy to throw up your hands particularly in this market and say, you know, this is all too hard to finance. We're going to shut everything down and we're just going to wait for happier times. That's not our modus operandi. We want to keep advancing this project. We can work on it 12 months of the year. So we're not constrained by uh, seasons. Um, and so we're just going to, as I said, we, we, we all believe in it. And, and we've got a very good team of people here, um, not including myself. I, you know, there's a very good board of directors here. Um, and so we we believe that we've really got an elephant by the tail here, and we won't stop until we've demonstrated that. Well, thirty six thousand hectares, <laughs> Lord. Yeah, it's a big area. I mean, obviously, it's not all going to be mineralized, but there is a lot of uh, gold that's been mined from the drainages here. As I said earlier, two million ounces that have come out of the drainages here in placer gold. There's probably another couple of million ounces still sitting in the sands uh, that. The, the gravels on surface here because and I say that because the the efficiency of the small-scale mining that was done here using sluice boxes which we you know this is sort of a, an approach that was used during the Yukon gold rush it hasn't changed much they it's the same sort of technology in a lot yeah. of cases yeah. um, it's not very efficient at recovering gold so there's probably an awful lot more gold just sitting in the in the sands on surface but but what we're after really is a multi-million ounce gold deposit um, in, in the, uh, which, which we believe is the source, um, sitting under and adjacent to the, to the existing drainages. The other thing, a point I would make is that, as you know, uh, we're in pretty good company. 
El Dorado Gold has a very advanced uh, project um, 20 kilometers to the southeast of us called Top and Tanzania. We were directly involved in the discovery of that. Um, that is now a fully permitted project. I think the other perception about Brazil, which frankly is wrong, is that projects don't get permitted in Brazil. They do. There have been one or two cases where projects have been uh, have had a few issues uh, and the permitting pro uh, process has dragged on. But our, our direct neighbors, El Dorado, now have, um, they have a project which is basically shovel ready. They've got the final licenses. Um, you know, the only the only impediment to, to them developing that is that is, is that company making a construction decision. And let's not forget when you look further further out, um, we have Nexa Resources, which is a very big zinc uh, mining company. Uh, it was listed in Toronto that has ground in the Tapajos. Anglo-American that uh, uh, has recently staked 2.5 million hectares in the Tapajos. And you've got large companies like Kinross, Yamana, Anglo Gold, Ashanti, that all operate big mines in Brazil. So, so I'm very bullish. Well, and amazing that, you know, you've been there for so long, right? And, and it's good that you stay dedicated to it, right? Um, sometimes we get to that situation where those who know it best love it the least. And, uh, yeah, I think for all our sakes, uh, shareholders in Cabral here, it's, it's good that you are still so wholeheartedly committed to making yeah. a serious discovery here. Uh, again, I think I think you need to be tenacious to succeed in this business. And I don't want to waste my time, and I'm sure no members of my time want to waste uh, our time pursuing a project which doesn't have that world class potential. You know, we're not here to 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 discover a small gold deposit and push that through in the production. We're we're here to discover a very large gold deposit and hopefully maximize the, the potential returns for our shareholders. But we need the market to cooperate. So, um, you know, as you know, uh, the market, the resource market is highly cyclical. Um, right now, it's in a, it's in a, everything is depressed. Everything's on sale. And I'd suggest to you that now is the ideal time when nobody else is buying. That's when you want to be looking at companies like ours and, and, and choosing ones that you think have a really good chance of success based on things like the capital structure, management, the asset, the upside, uh, the uh, jurisdiction, <laughs> who the neighbors are, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we tick most, if not all of those boxes. So yeah. I, for one, of one of those guys um, that, that believe that, you know, when things are tough like they are now, when everything's on sale, you should be backing up the truck. Yeah. Yeah. And you've been through this before. I've been through it a few times. Yeah. Well, glad that you're still in it. Uh, I, I know you left one of the, you had some big company experience too, right? And uh, I think the junior markets are better for having have you. Uh, I hope so. Yeah, I think like a lot of folks in our business, I started with um, major companies. And as you know, I lived in South America 10 years. So I really cut my teeth down there and I'm fluent in Spanish and Portuguese. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's a, it's a part of the world that, uh, I have spent 90% of my career working on, and, um, and I truly believe that there are still some very large deposits to be found down there, and I think Kuyu Kuyu is going to be one of those. Yeah, I was reading something about uh, peak gold today, and I just had to stop and say, you know, I don't, sorry, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And well, I wonder if the market doesn't get a bit scared um, with deposit type here. You know, some of the high-grade numbers that you're putting up, um, you know, those are, you don't need a lot of tonnage when you have the grade to get a big, you know, resource. Um, and I wonder if the market's not a bit puzzled by the size of the land package you have and then, you know, the high grade model. Well, I think, I think historically, uh, what we've done on this project is, in, you know, um, when our predecessor company, Magellan, was first working here, we were very focused on defining answers regardless of grade. And so we have this, uh, you know, significant low-grade resource. It's over a gram, but it's, it's about a million ounces, and it's, you know, 1.1, 1, 1 1.2 grams a ton average grade. Um, that really grade bears no reflection to the grades that we're seeing on surface because there are two styles of mineralization here. <laughs> 
there are these large low grade stock work zones and, and I would say 95% of the previous drilling has been directed towards those. So these are things that will grade anywhere from half a gram a ton up to one and a half, sometimes two grams a ton. And then there are all these high grade veins and sometimes they occur to together. And I think we've probably got only six or seven of the 179 drill holes on the project. There's probably only six or seven that have gone into these high grade veins and we're finding more and more of these veins. Mm -hmm. And so, there's clearly an awful lot of high-grade mineralization at QUQU that hasn't been even close to tested. And I think that if you look down through the press release, um, you know, you can see press releases in recent months on our website. You can see that some really spectacular numbers starting to come out of some of these veins. And as I said, most of them have not been tested. So as you point out, you don't need a lot of very high-grade material to really significantly uh, increase your grade and really start adding ounces. What you need to do, of course, is demonstrate continuity. So that will be a key, a key thing for us going forward. Well, and this recent auger drilling work, um, I, looking the new hole, the new line at least, seemed to be a very clear fence you know um the layout and the plan of that of that line seemed to make sense for kind of testing structure in that way um whereas i it seemed like some of the other stuff you know the historical stuff it's there's there's some consistency to it um but then other parts of it i don't know there's some stuff that's a bit more spotty here and there um so it's all this question about how you actually demonstrate that, right? And how do you do it efficiently, so you spend years and years and millions of dollars chasing it? Yeah, I mean, I, as I said earlier, I think, it, I think we really do, uh, I mean, we are starting to have a really good grip and starting to dial things in, in terms of how we vector into, you know, uh, additional mineralization on the project. And so um, the auger drilling, as we've already said, is, is kind of key. You know, previously, when we were working here with Magellan, we really weren't um, doing a lot of auger work. We were really relying on the soil sampling. And of course, um, you know, that was great for the areas that were not covered or were islands in this lake. Um, but, uh, you know, the rest of the property is really, um, is wide open. And well, so, and I wonder if the the soil sampling lends itself more to the lower grade mineralization as well. Um, yeah, sometimes it does. Yeah, I mean, we, we we have certainly found some higher grade mineralization that that was obviously exposed that's not covered by these sediments. Uh, some of that based on on soil sampling, but 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 yeah, to some extent, you're right, Peter, because the the lower grade zones tend to be wider. From you know, a central for example is a hundred meters wide. Whereas yeah. if you contrast that with some of the narrow veins, which are only a meter, two meters, three meters wide, if you're putting a soil grid on surface, then you're you're you know, and you're you're taking soils at twenty five or fifty meter spacings, good luck. Lines which are a hundred, two hundred meters apart, you obviously got a better chance of of picking up these larger lower grade zones. So I think yeah, I think there's some truth in what you just said. And I wonder, do we have a sense of the number of veins? Are you at a point at where you're even trying to count them yet? You know, sometimes with the high-grade structures, that's a, an exercise people go through. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so yet. I think um, uh, <laughs> there, there is a lot. I mean, um, would, would we have identified 100 different high-grade veins that are exposed on this property yet? No, I don't think it's 100. No, uh, not yet. Is but the fact 50? that you, yeah, that's a. It might, it might be fifty. I mean, it's certainly a lot more than twenty. Um, um, so you know, you know, and if you go on our website, you can see the main ones on. If you go through our press releases, we've got sort of a map there with the key fifteen or twenty uh, targets on there. Not all of which are high grade. Some of which are have low grade mineralization as well. Um, but that really doesn't uh, have all the high grade showings that we've. Um, mapped on surface on them. So we've just picked out the principal ones. So there is quite a lot, but we're still discovering more. I mean, um, yeah. and, and you know, there are still a few Garimperos working on here. Whereas the Garimpero is the Brazilian word for small miner. There are a few guys still here. So these guys keep turning things up too. So you know, once they expose something new, we, we, we get in there and take a sample. So um, no, I don't think we're even close to actually determining the, the uh, 
the number of new mineralized structures on this project. There are large areas within the property uh, that um, have seen an awful lot of placer gold mined from streams. Um, we don't yet know where that placer gold is coming from because we haven't had the opportunity to look yet. As I said at the beginning, it's a district scale play. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of work to still be done here. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of things that can scare people away, right? <laughs> so many targets. Um, you know, it creates a unique set of challenges for an exploration company. Uh, how to, you know, get some traction, whether, you know, keep extending, finding new ones or try and delineate ones that you have. It's it's not an easy choice on um, how to move forward there. Yeah, no, it's not. And you're continually sort of like, uh, as, as more information becomes available, you're, you're continually adjusting your ranking in terms of which targets you want to spend more time on, which ones you want to prioritize for drilling. But I cannot overemphasize the fact that gr the grade of these new uh, discoveries that we're making on surface is is a lot higher than the the existing resource. There is an awful lot of high grade mineralization at uh, at Kuyu Kuyu. And you know, if you again, if you look down through the list of press rele press releases for 2018, just picking one or two out, July 19th, we we talked about this Machichi area, which has only had one drill hole in it previously. It would have been one of the six holes that, that intersected the high grade vein. And and that one hole I think cut about three and a half meters at about seven or eight grams. Well Yep. We've now found there are a lot more high-grade veins at Machichi, um, and there's probably at least four or five different veins at Machichi, and some of these things on surface are running up to 336 grams a ton, uh, which is very high-grade. You don't need a lot of that material to really start adding significant ounces. I mean, um, and, and similarly, on June 19th, we talked about uh, a number of discoveries, particularly the Mora de Lua uh, system at Brazil, which again... Uh, within Kuyu Kuyu, which, which has had no drilling previously. We didn't know about it until a few months ago. We've been getting uh, really, really high grade numbers coming out of that as well. Those are just a couple of examples. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's, um, it's pretty exciting. I, I, you know, I, I have to say as a geologist, this stuff does keep me awake at, at night. When you're working on a, on a good project, yeah. I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but but you know, I was awake at 4:30 this morning thinking about uh, aspects <laughs> of the project, and, and that's not unusual for me. It doesn't happen every night, but but it is a very exciting project to be part of it. Um, yeah. We've worked hard on it. We've still got a lot of work to do, um, but I'm really optimistic that, that once we start drilling, we'll be able to demonstrate that a lot of these surface showings have down dip and a long strike continuity. Um, and there's, there is, I'm absolutely certain there will be uh, additional deposits found here. Yeah. Well, and, and Machichi, for me, that my jaw hit the floor when I saw that news come out. Um, I, you know, been following the story closely since you guys went public there and had seen some of the high grade stuff come out prior to that, but that one was something else. Yeah, I think that that if you speak to our chairman, uh, Mark Smith. Uh, Mark would say that's one of the targets that he really is keen on, Mashishi, because it uh, <laughs> it has such high grade mineralization and and, and it is surrounded by um, a lot of disseminated pyrite in the wall rocks, which is which is running lower grade. So hmm. there's probably a combination of, of styles of mineralization there, but but it is exciting. It's got a very good IP anomaly. It's only a few hundred meters uh, to the north of our Morera Gomez deposit, which itself has a four hundred thousand ounce existing resource on it uh, and Mashishi is most likely in our view a parallel structure or a series of parallel structures I mean Mashishi has the potential to be at least 400,000 uh, ounces possibly more and then there are a whole series of other what we think could be parallel structures where some of which we've done drilling on uh, and some of which we've done no drilling but we've collected samples from and got some good results so um, it's it that that whole area around Morera Gomez, Mashichi, and going further to the north. If you look at the maps on the website and in the press yeah. release, is yeah. is a high priority area for us. Well, and, and the repeating structures idea, uh, these east-west trending structures that seem to be magnetic lows, um, Morera Gomez. That's that's one's pretty clear there, and Machichi maybe a little bit less so. Um, there's a big low around it, uh, but maybe it's on the edge. This and that, you know. You, all the geophysics 
that go into that to uh, the potential to establish several of these repeating in close proximity is just, yeah, very exciting. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, these thousand, thousand piece jigsaw puzzles that some of us do around the holidays at the end of the year. And, and the more pieces that you get, you start to, uh, and you don't know what the overall picture is. So, you know, we sit there with the, with the, the, the cover of the box and put the pieces together. We don't have the, the box cover. We don't know what ultimately this thing's going to look like. So we, we keep adding pieces. But as we add pieces, and I, I feel with every press release and yeah. as the week go by, we're adding more and more pieces. And, and there is a picture slowly starting to emerge of Kuyu Kuyu, which yeah. is, you know, this is a going to be a large, significant district containing multiple deposits. Um, so, so you know, as I said earlier, it's, uh, I find it tremendously exciting. Well, and I believe there was a photo of Rari there going down a shaft, and that I thought that was pretty cool. And then the Michichi news hit, and as like, I wondered if that was the same shaft or or not, and it whether it didn't really matter either because it just goes to show me how prolific of an area this you know continues to be. Uh, all for the Gurumperos and everything there now, it's yeah. Good. Uh, I was actually with Rory on. I know the photo. You, I think we must have tweeted that. I don't think it went out in a press release. But yeah, I mean, you know, um, where these guys are uh, obviously the small miners are developing a few small shafts. Um, you know, it's um, it's important for us to go down and and sample those shafts and have a look. And uh, you know, sometimes. Um, you just have to get 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 your nose on the rock. So yeah, Rory, to his credit, you know, jumped on the hoist there and uh, and was winched down into a stream of uh, cold water. So, um, <laughs> but we did get the sample. So, well, and there's there's a there's a certain degree of adventure, you know, required uh, adventurousness required in being. Uh, you know, ex an explorationist, a geologist there, or, or being, even being an investor in these companies, you really have to be willing to embrace, you know, some kind of risk. And, and for, for projects that are uh, often places that, you know, are a little bit off the beaten path, uh, debatable whether this even is that, you know, but it's, it makes me wonder, I, like, why are there not more juniors <laughs> in the Tapajos? Um, well, it's one of those places I think that you have to, um, there's a steep learning curve. I mean, you have to have a good team on the ground. You have to have uh, sorted out, um, you know, which guys you can trust and which guys you can't. Um, you have to be, you have to have um, a working knowledge of the language um, and uh, and how to get things done in, 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 in Brazil. So there is that steep learning curve. And, you know, we've, I'll be the first one to admit that, uh, you know, at the beginning we made a few mistakes, um, but we've been there a long time. And as I said earlier, I believe that if you're going to make a difference, you have to be committed to it. And sometimes it just takes a little bit longer. And, uh, and I think we've made a good start. We've got a million ounces on the board right now, but my objective is to grow that several times over. And I think based on the, pieces of the jigsaw that we're putting uh, on the on the table right now that um, there's a very, very good chance that we'll be able to do that. There's certainly an awful lot more gold here. I mean, even if you look at our resources, and I think we've had this discussion previously, you know, the resource estimate that we've got of a million ounces really is a, um, that was based on a statistical exercise, which basically um, threw out all of our high grade numbers. And that's not unusual, by the way, in a uh, in a resource estimate, uh, because of the lack of data uh, in your data set um, at the high end. A lot of the high grade numbers in drill holes frequently get cut way back. So you know you can have numbers, and we've we've got numbers in our database of 100 grams, which is not incorporated in the database. That number is chopped back and assumed to be, in some cases, five grams, 10 grams, um, and. The interesting thing for us is that when that exercise was done by uh, the consulting firm that we used, Micon, earlier this year on our resource estimate, we lost about 55% of the goal that we'd actually intersected in drilling and analyzed. So, you know, uh, 
the cut resource, and by cut, cut I mean that they've cut the high grade numbers out of the database and they've cut them down to much lower numbers, is about a million ounces. But the uncut resource, taking the actual numbers that we got in drilling, was about 55% higher. It was 55% more gold suggested by the actual results that we got in the drilling. So, and that is a very big difference uh, when you look at estimates between cut numbers and, and uncut numbers. So, um, in, you know, when we come to mine this, we'll, we're going to be mining all that high-grade material. Uh, but because the uh, consultants are, 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 are looking at it from a, a statistical point of view and, and and, and looking at the lack of high-grade numbers that we've got, you know, there's only a small number of those high grades, but they have a very big impact. Um, you know, they cut the resource way back. So I think that's important to, to realize, too, that the uncut resource that we tried to explain to people a couple of months ago is actually uh, about 55% higher than the cut number. So, but, but yeah, I mean, I look... Uh, the Tapajos is an area which doesn't have a lot of um, uh, small companies working there. Um, you know, uh, it has been historically, um, uh, there's been a bit of a lack of infrastructure. That has changed hugely. We now have two roads to our site. When we first started working here um, in the Magellan days, um, we, we had no road to site. We had to barge stuff in and, and fly in to, to the project. Now there is very good road to the project. El Dorado's got its full mining license up and, uh, next door to us and so the tapajos is really changing but yeah i mean it, it does surprise me that given that this is the world's third largest uh, placer gold belt having produced such an enormous amount of gold between 1978 and 1995 that there aren't more companies there um but um you know well it's, it's recent it's, history i think to some degree you know that's that's part of it yeah, I mean, and, and the other important thing, as I've said to you several times previously, is that the Tapajos Belt was the site of the world's largest ever gold rush in history. You know, it's a fairly recent phenomenon, as you just mentioned, that between, as I said, in the late, really in the 80s and early 90s of the last century, it's only about 30, 40 years ago, there were a million people who rushed up here um, from all walks of life from all over Brazil and other countries too and were washing gold, sluicing gold from the, from the sediments here. So I've been on a personal quest for the last few years and it's consumed a large part of my career uh, <laughs> with the objective of finding as many of the hard rock sources of this gold as, as we possibly can. I'm a believer. Yeah. And well, I'm, I'm, and yeah, go ahead. Well, just to say that that, dedication that you have there is is really important um and it's not obvious maybe quite how important it is it reminds me of a speech eric sprott gave at jekyll island last year and he talked about a situation where he was analyzing some companies um you know projections of a, a, a company that was in production gold mine and he was talking to the the executives about what he thought you know the next few quarters of production were going to look like. Um, he'd been apparently digging into the resource model and trying to figure things out, and his numbers were significantly higher than management. And so he was bullish on the stock, of course, and you know he cl clashed uh, clashed heads a bit with the, <laughs> with the executives. And um, lo and behold, he ended up being proved right in that instance. And it's. Yeah, and, and he made it the point about consultants and and people who are there for you know a paycheck or, or something like who who don't want to be they're concerned with not failing and and then the other people who are there and they're concerned with achieving some success being the driving factor uh, and you know most junior mining executives are driven um, but you know the ability to um, focus that energy and, and everything and, and dedicate it into one consistent kind of idea and, and theme is, is really, really powerful, right? And, and to have Cabral working on Kuyu Kuyu, which, you know, you were, and you were there, Discovery, right? And we have worked this ground before in another public company. Um, all of that just speaks very profoundly to <laughs> these important things. And, and what's more, I'd, I'd say, is that it, Cabral itself as a pubco um, 
I, I'm it's it's uh, impressive to see 31 million shares issued and outstanding, and you know 41 fully diluted. Um, market cap below $10 million right now, uh, talking about a million ounces of gold on the books. Uh, that's less than $10 an ounce. Uh, this is, and all the exploration upside that we're talking about, uh, the news flow that you've had this year that's not in any of the resource estimates yet. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, agreed. I mean, th th there is a lot to do. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, in terms of valuation, um, our company and, and most of the companies in our space are not getting the uh, the kind of recognition that they uh, that, that, that some of them deserve. And, and I think, you know, I suggest to you that our, our, our company is one of those. Um, but uh, you have to just, um, if, if, you know, you have to have some belief in, uh, in what you're trying to achieve, and, and, and if you think you, you have a project that has an enormous upside to it, then um, it's important, I think, for management to, to, to demonstrate that. And so that's what we've been trying to do over the last few months, and that's what we're going to continue to try and do. Yeah. And the management ownership here, Epit, 42%. Yeah, I mean, we've written some pretty big checks as management um, um, with the company, and we're going to continue to do that. I certainly am. Um, you know, uh, we we have we do have a tight capital structure. We we take that seriously. We um, since we don't have cash flow, um, we are looking to, uh, you know, we are going to continue to have to raise money, hopefully at higher prices. But we are always very conscious of dilution and and uh, and, and uh, what we spend our money on. Uh, you know, it's a constant theme with us that uh, we're trying to maximize uh, the value of every dollar. The exchange rate in Brazil is certainly working in our favor right now. Um, that has had a material impact on our business in the last few months in terms of what we can get done with the dollars that we have available. Uh, so, but, but, you know, as I said, I'm going to continue writing checks and uh, and because I, I, I believe in the company and, and I believe in what we're doing and I believe in the people that we have on the team. Yeah. Well, and for those who aren't familiar with the story, um, RTO last fall at effectively 54 cents, I believe it is, and trading down now below half that price in the secondary markets. And yeah it's it's uh as i said it, it's tough the market has um has uh declined uh since since we went public uh about a year ago um uh, but you know we have continued to generate some very good results but unfortunately right now uh, very few people are interested uh, but um as i said peter this is a highly cyclical business uh, you have to have if you're investing in small companies like ours in the resource space a strong stomach. Um, nobody's suggesting we putting all your eggs in in one basket or, or for these sorts of things. But yeah. but um, you know we are looking to uh, uh, grow our resource and hence uh, grow the value of this company. The market will need to turn around, which it surely will at some point. Uh, I I really can't comment as to when that might be, but it surely will. And so. I think as an investor, you want to make sure that you're positioned in companies you believe in uh, with management teams that are uh, tenacious um, and have um, experience of finding things and, and raising money uh, because you will surely make money when things start to uh, start to improve because everything is on sale right now. It is yeah. an, uh, it's an um, enormous opportunity. Yeah. Enormous. Yeah. Well, and this isn't just, you know, 52-week lows or something like that for CBR. This is all-time lows for the stock, right? And if that's not a uh, very compelling, uh, that's a situation where you have to take note and see what's going on. Is the market giving you an opportunity here, or is the market trying to tell you something that you should be listening to? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think as an investor, because I invest in, in, in companies like ours, um, I, you know, as I said earlier, I think alluded to at the beginning, you know, I think you really need to look for management, management, and management. Probably the three <laughs> things. I mean, I know it sounds a, a, 
a bit tongue in cheek, but I can't overemphasize the importance of management. And by that, I mean having a good technical team, uh, a, a good you know, people that market themselves effectively, um, and people that can raise money. But beyond that, the company needs to have a good asset, preferably with uh, with, with a resource already defined. Uh, it needs to be in a good, stable jurisdiction where there are other companies that are uh, are currently working and mining. Um, I think you need to have it needs to have a good capital structure. Um, you know, you don't want if they make a discovery. You know, if you've got hundreds of millions of shares out, then it's it's much more difficult to see the kind of returns that I'm looking for. Um, um, you know, I'm not investing in companies like ours to make 10, 20 percent on my money. I'm looking for several hundred percent return at least. Um, and so, you know, I think some of those things are the th sorts of things that I look for when I when I when I'm looking at deploying my own uh, capital into things. So, yeah, and I, as I said earlier, I think Cabral ticks most, if not all, those boxes. And you've mentioned a couple times their ability to raise money. I wonder what that looks like um, for Cabral here going forward. Yeah, um, well, it is difficult. Um, you know, a lot of folks uh, don't seize the opportunity and, or, or are unable to seize the opportunity when, when everything's on sale. And, and how many times have we seen this, you know, where, um, yep. you know, <laughs> Everybody wants to buy when everything else is uh, is going up. By which time, you know, a lot of the upside has has has, has, has been taken out out of the equation. Um, so, look, we have some good shareholders in the company. Uh, Cisco Mining is a shareholder of ours. Um, the Royal Bank of Canada, the Precious Metals Fund is a is a shareholder. We have a number of other groups that are, wow. are shareholders. What some very well known people in our industry are also shareholders. So. Um, you know, I, I'm optimistic. We will raise money, and, and that tenacity in terms of that, that uh, I was talking about, in terms of our our ability as a management team and our belief in the project, extends through all aspects of our business. Yeah. Um, and that 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 also applies to uh, our ability and our belief in uh, and our approach to uh, raising additional capital. Um, you know. Right now, there's a lot of people who, who are not interested in investing, and that's fine. Um, that's all well and good. I understand that. And so I think you need to be prepared, uh, if you're in, a, in, a, in the role that I am, running a company like this, you need to be prepared to be not back and, and for a lot of no's. And that's all well and understood. But, but I think you also need to be uh, of the mindset that you'll just uh, keep going until – until you you know you, you do find people that are of a similar mindset to to us and, and truly believe in the project and believe that um, this is a an enormous opportunity to get positioned. So, well, so, and yeah. I recall in the fall last year when I heard about this and wrote a check myself as well. Um, I you know I was looking forward into the murky future of what might happen to Cabral and you know, thinking about all oh, the upside yeah sure maybe but it's uh, I will admit I'm um, almost more intrigued or or more uh, interested or something there's something special about um, the volatility in these stocks right the ability to be able to go back and get something for a fifty percent discount or more. Um, mm -hmm. While the fundamentals have gotten better, <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in, and you know, what's impacted uh, the resource business, particularly the junior end of the resource business uh, where we are uh, positioned, is that, you know, here in Canada, of course, there's been a lot of uh, people that have chased uh, the latest blockchain, blockchain idea, or the latest marijuana deal, and and some people have done very well at that, but. But equally, uh, a lot of that froth or that um, that uh, uh, rush into those uh, sectors is sort of starting to dissipate. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's only um, there are, there are limits to to what real valuations are. And I think the marijuana stocks in 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 particular in the last sort of six months or so have far exceeded the realistic valuations. Uh, that's my view. And so, you know, I think uh, the smart money will be looking at 
the undervalued stocks and sectors um, where they can, uh, you know, make significant gains. And I, I, I suggest to you that um, that the junior resource space is one of those sectors. You know, coming back to the whole fundraising thing and everything again, just looking at the the board and and management, um, the company's really grown up a lot. I would say since uh, since it launched. Right, um, Mark Smith is executive chairman there. Wow, uh, he brings a lot uh, to the to the management team, and I guess the directors those directors have been in, in since the RTO. Is that correct? Um, certainly, uh, Charles Oliver was, and Charles, as you know, was previously uh, the lead portfolio manager for uh, Sprott Precious Metals. He was also uh, a key board member of Integra, that was uh, bought by Alvarado a couple of years ago, and um, or a year ago, and he was also a director on of Clondex, which has just been acquired by Heckler, or about to be acquired by Heckler. So Charles has had a lot of success, and Charles, as a fund manager, has seen a lot of deals. Yeah. And so, um, you know, he's seen hundreds and hundreds of things. And so, and he called me to say, look, Alan, I'm really interested in that project of yours. I've always been interested in, in it. I'd like to be involved. And, and you know, Charles wrote, wrote a pretty big check. He put his money where his mouth is. Um, uh, Derek Wirerush is an, a very, very good uh, board member. He's, uh, he's uh, been CFO of various companies. He's got operating experience in Brazil. Mm -hmm. He's an excellent board member. And Mark himself, as, as I think we've previously discussed, has, has, you know, has had a career as a geologist, spent a number of years working with uh, Cominco, uh, then became an analyst in Toronto, worked for a number of fun, uh, firms and before transitioning to a, uh, a banking role. So he has a very in-depth knowledge of the capital markets um, and yet he's also got the technical expertise there. And, and I, again, I think the fact that he's agreed to, to, to come on the executive team in terms of management is a, is a testament to his belief in the, in the potential of the project. And, uh, you know, perhaps next time we chat, Peter, we could get Mark involved in that. Because I think uh, you would find it very interesting to get his perspective as well. Certainly. Please, and thank you. I, I always pay attention when I see an executive chairman um, involved. It's not the most common role to have for a junior, um, but the guys who step into that role are often very, very bullish. Yeah, I think Mark would uh, check that box, and it, you know, yeah, so he's making a significant contribution too. Um, Mark and I speak several times a day, and and um, and he's been uh, very, very useful. Wonderful. Um, and I'd ask maybe about the Itaituba, the 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 city or town up there again, um, just off the highway, Tapajos River. How has the summer been there? Um, it's a getting to be a, a booming town, I, I gather. Uh, yeah, it's a small city in Brazil terms. It's uh, Itaituba is a bit like Kelowna in terms of size. Um, it's about 250,000 people. Um, it's on the banks of the Rio Tapajos River, which at, at Itaituba is about three or four kilometers wide, uh, and ultimately is one of the main tributaries to the Amazon River. So um, it was the center of the gold rush I mentioned earlier. Um, oh, really? It did have the world's busiest airport for a year or two. In the early 80s, um, obviously these weren't jets that were taking off. They're all small planes, but there were an awful lot of takeoffs and landings. It was busier than Atlanta or London wow. in 1981, if you can believe it. Uh, yeah. Not in terms of passengers, but just in terms of takeoffs and landings. Um, now, the thing that is impacting Itaituba right now, probably uh, the most, is the fact that the main north-south highway uh, that runs south of Itaituba. Um, is a uh, has been paved, and um, and that uh, uh, is providing uh, a connection. There has always been a, a federal road there, but it was a graded dirt road. So in the rainy season, you know, the trucks used to get stuck. Dry season was fine, but during the wet season, the trucks would get stuck. That was paved a few years ago, about three or four years ago now, and so now we have this blacktop highway which runs all the way to the south to Cuyaba, which is, uh, must be at least 1,500 kilometers to the south. Wow. Now, as you travel south from Itaituba, you go 
past the Tapajos region, which we're working in, and, and you get into northern Mato Grosso, which is the next state. And northern Mato Grosso is where all the soybean comes from in Brazil, or most yeah. of it. It is an enormous soybean producing region. Yeah. And as you know, uh, Brazil produces 40% of the world's soybean. Now, historically, because the road was not good to the north, it wasn't uh, uh, tarred. All these soybean trucks uh, would travel south to Cuyaba, and then they would travel to the uh, to the coast to a port near Rio, which was about a two and a half thousand kilometer one way trip. Looks to give like you the line, way. yeah. During the harvest time, this would involve about this involves about five thousand trucks a day, big articulated trucks. It's an enormous amount of uh, traffic on the road. Now, because the road is now paved to the north. The trucks now have access to the Tapajos River to the north, which is much, much closer than going south and across to Rio. The trucking distance is only a few hundred kilometers. And so a whole bunch of uh, terminals have sprung up uh, on the Tapajos River, and there are, there are plans for up to 50 terminals. There's probably only about half a dozen in operation now. But these are enormous uh, terminals where uh, large ships can get in and load um, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of tons of soy, soy at a time. And so that's having a massive impact on, on Itaituba itself. There are, in addition to that, there are a number of hydroelectric schemes planned uh, and advanced planning stages uh, on or around the Tapajos River. So, so but the soybean trade in, in particular is having a massive impact on that town. Well and, it, well, and it makes this whole region look like an absolute, you know, a boom again. It's another boom is coming. Uh, it's not that long ago that this plastic, this gold rush happened here. And to look at the hydroelectric projects, five of them that I see marked on the map here, this is, yeah, this region is going to be ready for some heavy industry. Yeah, no, no it, it has enormous potential. I mean, there's a lot of agriculture, as I said, uh, the soybean, but there's also, don't forget, there's a lot of ranches, big ranches in the, in the region. Um, um, so, and, and then there is the, the, the gold business, you know, um, if, uh, if El Dorado do make a construction decision with their project, uh, that will be a $500 million capital cost. And that will also have a, a, a significant impact on, uh, on the economy, the local economy in, in the city of Itaituba, if, if it goes ahead. I mean, but do you think do that, to, sorry. Oh, sorry, but just to ask, do you think that El, talking to Zinio, would that is that's under like workforce and stuff? Is that over under five hundred people in terms of jobs? I uh, I can't remember. I don't know if they've actually said how many how many people would be employed. I would I guess mm -hmm. in the construction there'd be way more than that employed in the construction, uh, but it would be at least five hundred. I would think direct direct employees because because they're contemplating uh, if they do go ahead with it, Peter, it'll be a, a fairly large open pit gold mine it would be one of the largest uh, open pit gold mines in, in in brazil so you know i think the estimates are that, that it will be cranking out in the region of 160 to 180 thousand ounces a year so okay yeah it, it's not it won't it will not be a small mine and that's and that's on a deposit where they have the high grade veins but not the disseminated is that correct no they don't they don't have the other way around high -grade material it's the other way around theirs is really uh seems to be mainly lower grade stuff um, and I haven't been there for a long time so I, I can't comment on, on in terms of how how successful they've been at identifying high grade veins there but what I can tell you is that there there, there does not appear to have been any sort of significant uh, improvements in the grade of the project since they uh, acquired it in 2010 so um, grade has gone up slightly uh, with the reserve estimate but they haven't added uh, a lot of high grade material and maybe a question off the okay. off the map here a bit but placer you know placer gold miners and public markets seem to be like oil and water uh but they're helpful for you with your exploration work uh, is there any potential to find a way for them to be helpful um even for the financing of cabral in some way um, I don't know about the financing in particular, uh, uh, Peter, but they certainly are helpful from an exploration perspective because a number of these showings, uh, the new showings that we've, 
identified this this year have actually been things that the the small miners have exposed. So it is, and there aren't a lot of these guys. Um, uh, there's probably only about 50 or 60 of these guys currently working on the project. But uh, you know, on a fairly regular basis, they do. They are good prospectors, and they do uh, identify things that, that we haven't we haven't found. So it's like having a uh, an unpaid uh, platoon of guys that are out there every day and uh, uh, coming up with new showings. Well, I just wonder about some ability for you know them to some way to get some of the gold that's coming out of the ground there into the treasury of Cabral. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, they're not taking out a lot of gold. Uh, their, um, their, their value to us is really um, much greater value to us is in them uh, unearthing new things. Fair enough. Yep. If they're, yeah, I, I guess that's the necessary condition, right? I was, I, yeah, over, under a thousand ounces a year or something like that. I Maybe. Yeah. Wonderful. And stepping out a little bit too, um, looking at QU QU and the Air Mag survey and and the soils lines, you know, you go off all the way to the west there and Ret Retinio, and you have Aero Mag that's showing some continuation along that fault structure of interest. And again, I see some repeating lows in between some highs. Um, but there's, you know, there's no soil lines over there. Um, it's, it's a massive project, right? Uh, is, so is, is there any change in plan or it's, it's pretty much stay focused on <laughs> the area where you have good access? Um, I guess you mentioned a bit earlier that, you know, you've started sending teams a bit further afield. Yeah, we have started sending teams a little bit further afield. Uh, yeah, there's lots of upside here, Peter. There are, there are particularly to the northwest and the east uh, within the claim block. There are, there are some very interesting looking structures which have, uh, in a number of instances, have uh, streams that have been worked for placer gold, or where we've done no work at all yet. And so, uh, you, you know, it, it is a continual process. We'll, we'll keep uh, pursuing those uh, targets, but. Um, but we've, there's so much that is in and around uh, the the existing four deposits that we've defined so far. Um, that is keeping us pretty busy. Um, yeah. And obviously, the significance of finding uh, things that are very close to the existing resources could have a much bigger impact on the economics than finding something that's, that's that needs a, its own separate open pit and, and own separate infrastructure. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean that, uh, that you've spoke to the potential a bit further afield, but but yeah, I mean I, I, there is tremendous upside associated with that, but I think it'll be a while before we can get to the peripheral areas. And Bomb Jardine, Uniao, Porquino, um, you know some of the other projects in the company, um, two of which are in the Tocantinsino trend, one of which is. You know, a bit further south um, along Trans Garimpo Highway. Uh, I wonder, you know, any discussion within the company about trying to option those off or something like that as a non, you know, dilutive uh, financing or something like that? Yeah, there's been some discussion around it, Peter. I wouldn't say it's a priority for us right now. We're certainly not doing any work outside of Kuyu Kuyu. Yeah. Um, we are looking to farm one or two things out, and so uh, I, I think that like, in all likelihood there'll be some news on some of that stuff. Um, but um, but it's not a priority. The priority really is for us to demonstrate that uh, QEP itself is uh, has world class potential. Yeah, well, and it's not like it's a particularly hot market in the gold juniors for uh, optioning properties off like that necessarily. <laughs> no, that's Sometimes. right. If you're in the Golden Triangle in BC, maybe uh, things are a little crazy, but the rest of the world seems to be uh, in an ice bath of some kind there. It's <laughs> and looking back to the news again through 2018, so just February, right? Um, you're commencing your trenching program, and then in March, some of the first new high grade that we started to report on, and then through May, you know, June, Seeing in July there, the news flow just picking up so much. Um, 
you know, three significant news releases in, in one month. Um, they're in the midsummer too, when, you know, it's some people are, are not, the markets maybe are not paying attention or this or that is it's, it's, it's wild. Um, you guys have been setting quite a pace, uh, for people that wonder, you know, your ability to sustain it and stuff through the year and beyond. Yeah, well, we intend to uh, sustain that kind of pace, and, and then at some point towards the end of the year, we'll we'll need to consider uh, raising more money. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we'll be able to sustain that pace. I mean, I had hoped that we would be drilling a little bit earlier, but uh, to be honest, I think we've been just been sort of uh, very surprised at the number and quality of the targets that we've identified in the last uh, few months. And so what we don't want to do is is go off and, and, and drill, you know, two or three of these targets uh, that may not be the best areas. We want to make sure that we've had a very good look at everything on surface. And and I, I just cannot overemphasize this enough. I think all of the work that we've done over the last few months really, really has, has significantly enhanced the quality of the project in terms of grade, and I think speaking to the fact that there is uh, most likely a series of deposits contained within this plane block that are going to amount to uh, several million ounces. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.